Hi everyone, welcome back. And if this is your first time, welcome. My name is Max Haddad, and today I'd like to talk to you about some misconceptions about addiction specifically, but there is some overlap with mental illness in general. Now, disclaimer, I'm a recovering addict and I've been diagnosed with first depression and then bipolar. So I can tell you what it's like to have addiction. I can tell you what it's like to have bipolar, but those things are subjective. It changes based on who has them. Not everybody has every symptom and not everybody has every symptom to the same degree that I do or somebody else does or it's better for me, worse for them, that sort of thing. I can't tell you what it's like to have schizophrenia. I haven't had it. I hope I don't have it. It doesn't seem like I do. I know some things about schizophrenia just from being alive and hearing them, I guess but I wouldn't feel comfortable speaking about things that I'm not sure are true, at least true for me. So, oh, and the last one that I'm gonna talk about today is a little bit contentious, so stick around. Uh, I would really, really love to hear your opinions about this in the comments, so let me know down below what you think. Um, there's a lot of opinions. Definitely not everyone's gonna agree with me, and, and that's okay. That's one of my favorite things about this channel is getting into discussions with you guys. So the first thing is something that I heard actually waking up from one of my first overdoses, uh, heroin overdoses. I don't know, that was confusing to me. The doctor was sitting there with my mom and me um, and I was basically getting ready to leave the hospital. I think I left maybe the next morning and he was telling me that I needed to replace my addiction. Now, this isn't like that earlier video where people say you have to be addicted to something. So get addicted to exercise, get addicted to reading. He meant like I needed a hobby, basically. He was telling me that uh, you need to find smarter ways to fill your time. And he wasn't calling me stupid. He was trying to be helpful. And I, I appreciated it. I didn't get mad because he was trying to help. But I was a little disappointed that somebody who'd been to school for at least eight years and was you know, the head doctor of this hospital, or at least one of them, um, that this was the best idea he could come up with. He told me to play some of my favorite music and make a list of things that I would like to do. And that's it. That's all. That's all he said. Now, it's not a bad idea, okay, to have an idea of uh, like a, a bucket list sort of thing. I want to do this. And if I keep using, I'm not going to get to do these things or I'm interested, I wanna learn how to skateboard, right? And if I'm using, I'm never gonna do that. That sort of thing, it's not a terrible idea. But turning on Neil Young and writing a list of, how I wanna learn how to sew is not going to save me in those moments where I'm sober, I'm white knuckling it, and I'm doing everything I can to not run out the door to my dealer. So, I think sometimes people think addiction is a problem that is based in someone's lack of time management or priorities that are out of whack. And yes, my priorities might have been out of whack because I was young or immature or whatever it is, but it's never like I thought heroin was worth more than my parents' love or their happiness or my happiness or the relationship that I had or, you know, taking my dog on a walk. It never, it never occurred to me that, God, you know, I love those people, but I love heroin more. It was never like that. I hated heroin. I hated what it had done to me. I hated the way that it made me act towards these people and things that I loved. It wasn't a question of my priorities. It wasn't a question of where I wanted to spend my time. It was a question of those moments when I'd lost control of myself, whether I was high or not, whether I'd been sober for six months or 24 hours. It was a matter of mental illness, losing control. If it was something I could control, it wouldn't have been a disease and it is a disease. It's not as simple as making a list of things that you would like to do, unfortunately. It'd be nice if it was. The second misconception about addiction is uh, something that I heard, at least the one that I remember the most, um, I had already been arrested for the pharmacy robbery. I was out on pretrial release, basically bail, and I had stolen my parents' car. I hit a flagpole 
on the way home in somebody's yard um, and drive home sobbing, pull into the neighbor, you know, pull into my driveway or whatever in front of the house. I go into a blackout. I was so insanely out of control. Okay. I wake up the next morning. Uh, I've been told that at least I didn't kill anybody. Um, knock on the door. I assume it's the police. It's not. It's the neighbor whose flagpole I hit. And she's being stern and I'm letting her talk, letting her talk. I'm listening. I'm as hungover as I ever get, which I honestly never got very hungover. It was probably one of the reasons that I was able to drink so much and it became an issue. But she tells me that she just wants me to pay for the flagpole, which was nice. You know, she didn't want me to go to jail and tells me that, uh, actually he's now talking past me to my mom and tells my mom that he's got to get some new friends. Sorry. It took me a long time to get to point number two, misconception number two. No, it's not just about the friends that the addict, you know, or you have, if you're the addict, I didn't have any friends. I haven't had any friends, haven't had any, I didn't, I hadn't had any friends for years. I would have a girlfriend who I kept emotionally hostage and that was it. I might socialize with people occasionally, but it was typically me putting myself in the spotlight, you know, manic trying to get attention or completely isolated, alienated. I didn't have any real friends that I was communicating with. There were other guys my age that loved me, that cared about me, that would uh, like to be my friend, that I consider friends, but I just didn't see anyone. Nobody in my life was doing the things that I was doing. Nobody was using every day. Nobody was risking human life by driving that drunk. Nobody. It had nothing to do with uh, with influence from other people. Now, when I was younger, was I, uh, you know, uh, cohorting around with people that were smoking pot and stuff? Yes, but my theory on that, and this is one of those things that might, you know, different for other people. Yeah, maybe, maybe this guy did get influenced by his friends and they were smoke, dude, everybody does it. My theory on this is we, uh, 15 year old Max, 15 year old friends that I had, we found each other because of our similar interests. It wasn't like we were all innocent except for this one guy and he showed up with a bag of weed and convinced us all to smoke. Okay. Now, did we enable each other? Yes. Did we do drugs with each other? Yes. But by the time somebody gets to be a tragic alcoholic, a desperate drug addict. It's not their pals, it, you know, convincing them to, oh, just go on one last crack bender. It's got nothing to do with that. Friends are a thing of the past by the time somebody gets to that place. My parents were basically a thing of the past. They were not going anywhere, but I had pushed them out of my life emotionally i couldn't handle real feelings real love real care real empathy. i couldn't handle somebody loving me and if i couldn't handle my parents doing it, i wasn't going to have other people in my life that i was going to have to either lie to or explain myself to and i wasn't going to explain myself to anybody i was so full of shame and so full of anger that this is the hand that i had been dealt or dealt myself that no, it had nothing to do with the people I was hanging out with. And if I had to make up a number on the spot, which I will, I would guess that in 95 or more percent of cases of like severe life-threatening addiction, it's got nothing to do with who they're hanging out with. They might be hanging out with people doing the same thing, but going to a crack house to score and there being people there is not the same thing as hanging out, right? It's not bingo night. We're not getting out the Monopoly board and hitting the crack pipe. We just all happen to be in the same place doing our drug of choice, okay? So not mad at her for saying that, you know, she was trying to be helpful. It came off as naive, that's fine. And I was in a much angrier place then than I am now. 
So I might have been pissed at the time. I probably was. I probably thought that she was stupid. What an idiot. And I should have just been grateful that she didn't want me to go to jail for crashing into her yard, right? And that was, again, not the worst thing I did the day before. So crazy. So the last thing, uh, the last misconception I want to talk to you about is the one that I feel like most, is the one that I feel like there will be the most disagreement about. So whether when you're depressed, inactive addiction, whatever it is, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Okay, any of you out there who have suffered from depression, anxiety, addiction, or have a loved one that has, has probably heard the pull yourself up by your bootstraps, get your shit together, be a man, be a, an adult, whatever it is, grow some, grow a pair, whatever, you know, grow up lady, grow a pair, woman, you know, dumb, dumb. Well, here, let me explain myself first. So this is why it's a little complicated for me, at least. There were definitely times in my life that I was depressed and it was not simply a matter of my brain being defunct in that moment. It was circumstantial. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think of it like this, that there are two types of depression. One is a rational and logical response to an awful life. Okay. You're going through a divorce, you're about to lose the house, you're unemployed, your kids won't talk to you, your dog just bit you and now it's peeing on the rug, you're 50 pounds overweight and you can't bring yourself to exercise, you're binge eating, you're not getting enough sleep, you're miserable and it makes sense. It's unfortunate, it's sad, it doesn't make you feel any better but it makes sense. It's circumstantial, it's in your hands but there is so much in your hands that you can't carry any of it. And then there's depression where everything's basically spiffy, going well, family loves you, job's great, you've got a, a number of friends that love and care about you and you love and care about them, you've got uh, things that keep you busy outside of work that are fulfilling, you meet most or all of the parameters of how to be happy, uh, and at least in a Western society, and yet still you are bummed out. At night you're sitting on the edge of the, your bed and you can't stand your life for some reason. And it's not because you're working a job you shouldn't, or you're married to somebody you shouldn't be married to, or dating somebody you shouldn't be dating. You know, it's everything fits, it's authentic, it's genuine to you, but you just don't feel well. That to me is biological depression. The type of depression that can be fixed with a pill because there aren't things in your life there are not a million messes you have to clean up, right? So there are times, have been times, still are, still probably will be times in my life when I am circumstantially justified in being depressed because I have made a mess of my life. Like when I was waiting to go to prison, couldn't stay sober, terrible anxiety because I was, this date was coming up, it was on the horizon that I was gonna be taken away from everything I loved, you know? Um, in a foreign place that was dangerous and I didn't know how to navigate it. I was depressed and it made sense, okay? Now, there were things I could have done to be happier in that. So to some extent, yes, sometimes you could pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I still think it's a little blunt. It's a little too harsh because without someone's help without somebody holding your hand, helping you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, whatever, it can be tough to get that momentum going. If you're not connected to people that are motivating you, for me, it can seem like, what's the point? I don't want to speak for other people. So if you're depressed, if you're in active addiction, do you need to pull yourself up your bootstraps? I don't know that I've made my point on this clear. The misconception. Let me simplify it, is that you all, it's always your fault. You need to work harder. You need to do more things. You need to do better things. You need to diet, exercise, this, that, and the other. It's not always the case. And in fact, I would say in a good portion of cases, it is not that you need to do a better job at living your life. Depression, mental illness in general, addiction, these are complicated things that if they could be easily understood 
and paraphrased and cured with one statement for all people, it'd be done already. Humans are smart. We are capable, persistent. We've got grit. We don't just <laughs> stay in a problem unless it's a complicated one. So I don't know what's the point of the video. Give people some credit when they're in a, in a hole, in a rut. Maybe they don't feel like they can pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Anyways, I hope you all are doing wonderful. Thank you for listening to the video. Have a great day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.